So this summer, there's been a series of sermons on the fruit of the Spirit. And it's my understanding that Paul and Mary have been having you say the verse together to try to memorize it over the time here. And this uh, verse is from Galatians 5, 22 to 23, that lists the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and you'll note that today, for the first time in your bulletin, it is not printed. This is your final exam. Now, it is on the front, but if you have one of the copied ones, there are some missing that didn't copy the bulletin print. So, I ask you now, can you repeat them back to me so that I know them, so that I can preach on them? I'll uh, get you started here. For the fruit of the Spirit are these. Joy. Joy. Okay, I'm going to go into a metaphor here. This is 
a little bit of a uh, stretch, so work with me. Close your eyes. I want you to picture yourself as a stately tree, a fruit tree. Maybe it's apple, maybe it's pear, maybe it's some hybrid of both. It doesn't really matter. If you are a fruit tree. You are rooted in the ground, in the soil, and all those roots tie together and are Jesus Christ, our root. Our trunks grow up strong from that, and from the top we have our branches leading out the blossoms of the fruit that is to come. And those blossoms are there, and they are to be brought to fruit by the Spirit. Now, in order for this to happen, there's also one more figure that's involved. Walking through the orchard of all of us together is God, the tender gardener, who brings about changes and helps us to move around. Now, if we come back to ourselves here in the sanctuary, we are not trees. But like these trees, we have blossoms. And these blossoms need to be stretched towards God's hand, the gardener's hand, in order to be fertilized, to form fruit. Now, in order to do that, we don't choose to grow fruit. We choose to move the blossom. And this is a very, very, maybe nitpicky detail, but it's one that I, I care about. In your bulletin, there's a purple sheet, a blue sheet, a colored card sheet of some sort. And that sheet has on it a, a little um, uh, devotion about choosing. And it says, I choose love, I choose joy, I choose peace, and all the rest of these. It's something that's a useful devotion in the morning when waking. The one thing I dislike about it, and would encourage you to change, is instead of having it say, I choose these things, because these are the fruit of the Spirit, and we can't choose them ourselves. I choose toward these things. I'm going to choose actions in my life that lead me toward these fruits existing with me. Um, you see, God is at work, truly at work in the world, wherever we see the fruit. Whenever we see one of those fruits of the Spirit, we know that God is there. It's a reminder to us that God exists with us, walking our garden paths, our orchard uh, together. And, like a fruit, the divine love of God that grows on our wonderful orchard makes copies of itself. When you are filled to bursting with the Spirit, giving that Spirit away doesn't diminish it in yourself. Just like losing a fruit from the tree doesn't diminish the value of the other fruit on the tree. But instead, it starts new seedlings, starts new orchards even, as you get to various places. So, love copies itself and makes itself known through the world. God, then, is ever with us. And we are not creatures of spirit trapped in this fleshy being, but creatures of spirit and flesh intertwined. For every time we show love or see love, we know God is there with us, too. It's not just us alone. Okay, I'm going to get a little bit word nerdy here for a moment, so bear with me if words aren't your thing. I'm a big fan of etymology and where things come from. And, oh, these translations are fun too. So, our English word love, we have lots of different meanings. Um, there's the, the 10 things I hate about you that has the, well, I love my product, I, you know, something else. That, I don't like that usage, but that is a usage in popular culture. Greek had four different words that have some bearing on what we call love agape, eros, Storge and phileo. Um, agape is usually translated divine love. That's also the, the karatas in Latin. Uh, eros is related to the word erotic. Um, it means physical love. Um, storge is family love. There's not really a cognate for storge, I'm sorry. It doesn't really have anything in English. And it's sort of um, like the love between a parent and a child, or a child for a parent, that kind of hierarchical, but family love. And then phileo, which you should recognize from Philadelphia, uh, philodendron, and some other things like that, that means brotherly, or sisterly, or siblingly, if there were such a word, love. All of these very specific words were very specific types of love. The thing of it is, though, agape, divine love, kind of combines them all into 
to one. In, in many ways, divine love, when we tend to think of it at purity, church services like this one, other places, we tend to think of divine love being top down. God loves us and just kind of pours out God's love and then we have some God's love to share as well in just kind of one direction. But some commentators in the 1950s have been arguing that divine love is also used through the, the Greek, uh, agape is used throughout the Greek Bible, the New Testament. Um, not only for God's love for us, but for our love for each other as a Christian community, for our love for God in return. Divine love, then, has three elements. Esteem, devotion, and mutuality. Divine love shows esteem, or the value of the other person. It says, you are important to me, and you have value of your own. It doesn't diminish someone else. Divine love shows devotion, or commitment to the other. It says, I am committed to working with you for the long haul, not just, I'm going to give you a hug and I'll never see you again. It also shows mutuality, or the desire for love return. When we show true divine love to each other or to God, we have a desire for God to love us back, for each other to love us back. Likewise, because it's the same love, God has a desire for us to love God in return. That's a powerful metaphor, and I'll come back to it a quote just moved me as I was working through this. But um, let's go back to our, our metaphor of the orchard. We have here our trees with our blossoms, and we have the opportunity to turn those blossoms toward God to be fertilized or to turn those blossoms away from Him. Not meaning that God can't reach them if God chooses, but we have the option to do so toward Now, all right, a little biology. Um, how many of you have seen a sunflower? Hoping there's lots of hands. Okay, now, are you aware that the sunflower follows the sun in the sky? That it, it chooses to follow the sun? Do you know the reason for that? That the stem of the sunflower is very, very fragile and doesn't like to be in, in full sunlight, um, nor do the leaves particularly. So it grows this huge flower to try to follow the sun and keep itself in shade the whole time. Now, that part of the metaphor I'm not caring for. But, I like the idea of a plant, an ordinary plant, that's able to choose what direction to face, based on just simple cues from the sun. So I, I, that image in my mind is what I mean when I say the blossoms turn towards God or turn away. Okay, but here's the real question. How do we decide where to turn the flowers? If God is there when we see the fruit, God's there when we don't see the fruit too, but how do we know where to bring the fruit about? Well, Paul, um, the Apostle Paul, uh, Pastor Paul, happens to have a great section in um, the book of the Epistle to the Romans, in the letter to the Roman Church, where he gives some practical advice for a Christian community. Uh, this is from Romans 12, and it's verses 9 through 21. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Wow. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This entire passage has lots of little detail, lots of 
little things that he can do that really choose to move those blossoms towards God. But I'd like to sum it up, because I'm one who likes to sum things up instead of trying to go through each little detail and we'll be here for hours, uh, with a sense of something called Christian empathy. And all of this passage can be summed up in three simple ways. Rejoice in hope, endure in tribulation, and seek God in all things. Okay, lots of highfalutin language. Rejoicing in hope means that when other people are happy, we should be happy with them and for them. Not, uh, what's the uh, German word, schadenfreude, where you have laughter or joy at someone's pain. That's not what we're going for here. We're looking for happy with happy, sad with sad. When somebody is troubled, weep with them and stick by them. Don't just, you know, give them, oh, I'm so sorry, but be there with them. Your presence is almost more important than the words that you speak. Lastly, by seeking God in all situations, we learn to feel with God, to feel with God's feelings. Now, empathy means to feel with. It's a chance to work with someone, to, to feel what they're feeling. It's different from sympathy. Sympathy says, you feel a certain way, I feel bad for the way you're feeling, but I don't feel exactly the same way you do. Empathy says, I'm right there with you, uh, feeling what you feel. Part of that, then, is in contributing or participating in the needs of, of, the needs of others. That is, where others are needy. Um, don't just say, oh, that's too bad for you. But work with them and be in the, in the muck, <laughs> as it were. Um, and this, you know, again, uh, this is an opportunity to use our gifts. Um, as the First Peter passage said earlier, this is a chance for us to speak, to speak as though we were God, to serve with the strength of God. I'm going to give you a direct example of this. Uh, this summer, I was working uh, with an organization called the Night Ministry in Chicago. Um, and the Night Ministry was founded in 76 uh, by one pastor who went out into Chicago and sat down with members of the homeless population and brought them coffee or just had a chat or found out what they needed and brought it to them when they came back the next time. Um, and from this practice of just being with people and being in their environment, weeping with them, rejoicing with them when they find housing or a job, uh, an entire ministry grew. And this ministry has gotten to the point that it runs shelters in the city now that are available for people who need them. It, uh, brings in donations of clothing and food and medical care uh, and all sorts of other wonderful ways of helping people. And it's not just with, oh, here's all your stuff, go pick it out, but volunteers from the community. Both volunteers from people of areas of the city that are nicer and areas of the city that aren't so nice. Um, it's people who have gone through some of the shelters before that have come back and volunteered again, as well as people who are working on their pastoral education myself. Um, and my role there was to be with people as a pastoral guide. They wanted to pray, I prayed with them in their language. Um, usually, by that I don't mean their spoken language, but their prayer language. Uh, if they needed a sandwich, I'd grab two sandwiches and sit down with them and eat a sandwich with them. Uh, these sorts of things were how this ministry went ahead. And that was my way of sharing my gift of pastoral ministry. Now there are other gifts. There are gifts that involve, say, cooking. Um, in one place in Chicago, the, uh, the food kitchen, um, soup kitchen, maybe called sometimes, um, was run at one point by a group of people that were from churches in the area and it served mostly um, people in the area who were hungry, as you would expect. Over time, though, it, it turned out that many of the people who were hungry had the gift, had the gift of cooking, and were able to move into the place of serving others while they were serving themselves at the same time. This is the kind of practical ministry opportunities that we can work towards to turn our blossoms towards God. Christian empathy as we practice it. Because remember, divine love, the beginning and end of the fruit, desires mutuality and not hierarchy. This isn't something of a one-way street where there's different layers of how wonderful your divine love is, but something where we work together for the building of God's kingdom. I'm going to share with you a quote from a theologian. Uh, this is from the Interpreter's Bible from the 1950s. Um, and that just blows me away. And I'll 
talk about it. As I was working through it, I had to just bring this back. One-sided emphasis on God's love as unmotivated by anything in God's creatures tempts humanity to regard God in the light of an egotistical philanthropist who expects gratitude and praise, but neither needs nor desires the mutuality that is inherent in the very nature of love. Not the least of the marks of God's grace is the divine human partnership proclaimed by Paul. This means that humanity's response must be motivated by something that goes deeper than gratitude. Without a faith that dares to humbly believe that God needs humanity's love, and that God has made humanity's service an integral part of the infinite enterprise of creation, the Christian's conception of their high calling to be a kingdom builder is liable to reduce itself to blind obedience to commands given arbitrarily for humanity's good, while awaiting God's eschatological fiat. Okay, big words. It means God's commands at the end times. Such a misconception is bound to give aid and comfort to the inclination of human nature, the flesh, to divorce religion from ethics. I'll read that last again. Such a misconception is bound to give aid and comfort to the inclination of human nature, the flesh, to divorce religion from ethics. That is to say that we are reasonable human beings who have a gift from God of reason and able to choose to move the blossom towards God. If we just blindly assume that following things that we don't quite understand, but it seems like a good idea to do so, we lose a lot of the meaning, the spirit-filled nature of what's going on with these commands. It's an opportunity that religion becomes dead, a series of laws and ordinances and practices, and not a living, breathing, reformed thing. So, let's recap. We are the orchard of God, who grow the fruit of the Spirit. We are tended, nourished, and encouraged by God. Our blossoms can be turned toward or away from God's love, and our free will is what allows us to do this. To turn toward God, we must seek God in all situations and practice Christian empathy. The fruit will grow strong when we take these actions. Now, as an opportunity to think about this a little bit, let's take about five minutes and turn to our neighbors in the pews, as I'd like to ask you to do, and answer a couple questions. Have a conversation along these questions. Where have you seen the fruit of the Spirit this summer? That's a broad question that gives you a lot of room to work with. The second question, how have you or someone you know practiced Christian empathy? That is, how have you wept with those who weep, rejoiced with those who rejoice, or seek God where God may be hidden at me of you? So let's take five minutes and talk to each other. Son, Jesus Christ.